Okay, welcome everyone to another Master Investor webinar with me, James Faulkner, and my partner in crime, Victor Hill. Welcome to the show, Victor. Hello, James. Good to see you again. Good to see you. You definitely. How are you? Um, I'm good. I'm good. You're definitely out doing me in the sartorial stakes today, and um, looking very sage with all your all your books behind you. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm I'm going to buy you a tie for Christmas, James. <laughs> good stuff so um as ever thank you everybody um for signing up for today's webinar we're very flattered with today's turnout and we're going to do our best to keep you all entertained we won't be taking any questions today but do feel free to email me or victor directly if you'd like to see any topics in particular addressed either in the show or via content on the website and you can reach us at info at masterinvestor.co.uk as usual, being a live webinar, we are at the mercy of technology, so please do bear with us if we encounter any problems. This webinar has been recorded. We'll send you an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, or you can find the video recording on our YouTube channel and an audio recording via our podcast. To help us to continually improve the webinar, um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. So um, at the end of the webinar, you'll see a link to a short feedback survey. Um, that will take just a few minutes of your time, so please do share your thoughts there. Finally, if you haven't already, please do sign up to our mailing list at masterinvestor.co.uk to keep up to date with all the future webinars and other content. Okie dokie, so uh, let's kick off. Um, Victor, I don't think anybody would have predicted um, that we'd be where we are today, um, back in March when we went into first lockdown. Yeah. Um, just just put the uh, the current status quo into perspective in terms of the, the situation regarding the pandemic? Well, I did a webinar with you and with uh, Jim Mellon and James Faulkner, 22nd of April. And the big uh, theme there was that we had passed the peak in terms of new infections and, and, and deaths in the UK at least. And we were on the downward slope. And we knew at that point that the lockdown would last a bit longer but there was some degree of optimism in the air. So what's happening now, if, if you'd like to um, show us the first slide, uh, James, is that we have gone through uh, a lockdown of more, than, more or less three months um, in line with most of our European peers and um, in line with some of the states in the US of A. Um, 23rd of March, Boris Johnson announced the lockdown um, 4th of July was when that lockdown was relaxed. There was some partial relaxation in May, as we recall. The pubs reopened on 4th of July. The gyms reopened, as I recall, on the 25th of July. There was some degree of normality over the summer months. People started traveling again uh, with their summer holidays in August and in early September. Then the quarantining began such that people were disincentivized from foreign travel. Um, but then the numbers turned against us once again, and cases uh, ticked up, having been uh, locally concentrated in certain hotspots. Um, there seems to be a general upward trend. Now, I think it's worth saying that um, we have learned a lot about the virus and about how to treat it and about how to handle the pandemic. Um, and I think there is some grounds for cautious optimism insofar as we're now testing far more people. It's up to 300,000 a day, I, I, I believe. Um, yes, the number of cases is going up. On Monday in the UK, there were uh, 13,700 uh, more cases, um, but that's out of a larger uh, testing field. So you would expect the number of cases that have been uh, identified to increase. The real um, variable is hospitalizations. Uh, and that unfortunately is increasing, but not by so much as it was mm. back in, in um, early March. Um, and of course, there is a lag, lag time, a lead time between hospitalizations and mortality of up to two weeks. Um, I don't think we're going to experience a degree of mortality that we did in, in, in the very somber month, weeks of late March and early April, when I think at the peak, something like 7,000 people died in one day. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have treatments such as um, 
dexamethasone, a very cheap uh, standard uh, steroid, which is beneficial. Doctors are not um, putting patients on ventilators quite so frequently and quickly. Um, and there are other uh, uh, treatments available. Um, there's more experience, there's more, there's more knowledge of, of, uh, of how best to handle this. Um, but the fact is that, as you can see on the graphic, um, the number of, of, of um, deaths is creeping upwards. And so, if you remember, at the very early stages of the pandemic, uh, Boris Johnson's objective was to flatten the sombrero. <laughs> and what we got eventually was a camel's hump. Um, the real danger, the real fear now, is whether that camel's hump will become a dromedary's double hump. Yeah. And um, you, mentioned, you mentioned testing a while back, and if we can just bring the, um, the second slide up. Um, you can see this. Um, this is this is actually a very long image, as you can see. So the the image on the right hand side is um, is what was produced in the Economist, um, and you can see the text on the image on the left hand side. But the the the, the sort of um, the bottom line of this image was that we weren't doing any testing in the first wave, were we, Victor? Um, compared to what we would what we're doing now, and so although cases are much higher, um, the amount of you, you've got to sort of um, set that against the amount of testing what's being done um, and then also the, the the death rate so once you put that into perspective it it's not as frightening as as it for, as it might seem at first hand when people just look at the um, the cases rising to a, to a level above what they were in the first wave right I, I, I think um, that that's correct we don't panic is the is the general message having said that we've got a problem and the, 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 the difference of opinion is how profound that problem is. So if you go back to the 21st of September, uh, there was a press conference given by Valence and Whitty. Um, Patrick Valence is the chief medical officer for England. Uh, Chris Whitty is the chairman of the SAGE committee, which advises the, the cabinet. Um, what they said at that um, press conference, and by the way, they addressed journalists in Downing Street without the presence of any politicians, and they refused to take uh, questions afterwards. And they referred to a model, the exact uh, contents of which we, we, are, we still don't know. And they, they were looking at um, the number of cases doubling then, this is 21st of September, uh, every week. Okay, well, that hasn't happened. Yeah. In fact, the, the latest figures suggest that case numbers in the UK are doubling every two weeks. Now, that is, that is very concerning because you still get the geometric increase in, in, in cases and, and therefore ultimately in, in deaths, even if the mortality rate is declining. Um, but just to put this into perspective, um, on that basis, Valence and Whitty were expecting 50,000 new cases per day by mid-October. Right. Well, it's now mid-October and we've got 13,000 cases a day. Yeah. So, so they were, if I may say so, they were wrong. Uh, now, the political controversy today, the, 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 the breakdown of the con consensus between Labour and, and the Tory government is based on the minutes of a meeting which took place just before that press conference. So, the powers that be in SAGE wanted a full lockdown in the third week of September based on a model which we now know to be wrong. So it, 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 if, if we may, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the difference in opinion amongst the epi epidemiologists. Can we do that now or shall we wait? Go. Um, I think we can touch on that, Victor, but um, I just want to move on um, swift yeah. after that um, to, sure. the, to the implications for you know, for the economy and markets. Yeah. So, um, basically, we've got a, we, we, we've, you know, one sympathizes with Mr. Johnson and his government. I mean, they're, they're, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If they don't impose, um, you know, severe restrictions in response to the increase in the numbers, they're going to be blamed um, with putting lives at risk. And they're going to be told, you know, they've, they've 
they've committed a, a hugely irresponsible act. If the lockdowns are too severe, then they're going to be criticized by the libertarian wing of the Tory party and others who maintain that in fact, this is going to destroy the economy and it impinges on personal freedom and that it is uh, unnecessary. Um, so <laughs> two days ago, I think Mark, um, uh, Tim Price, the fund manager, published a piece in Master Investor in which he quoted at length from the writer Lionel Shriver, who gives an, ex uh, an, an extended and very, very eloquent case um, for the libertarian view of why lockdowns don't work. But in fact, the, the libertarian view is also um, uh, supported by a, a group of epi epidemiologists who differ from the people who are running SAGE. Now, it's an extraordinary thing, but there's been a, uh, something that's not very, well, not very well known. There's been a kind of a feud for several years between the epidemiology departments in Oxford University and Imperial College London. Yeah. And it's the Imperial College people, um, Neil uh, Ferguson with his famous model back in March, um, who have effectively captured stay, SAGE. While the Oxford group and certain allies of theirs in the US have gone off in their own uh, direction. And I don't know if you saw um, something that hasn't been adequately reported. Um, on 4th of October um, in Massachusetts, USA, they, uh, three major scientists, three heavyweight scientists, issued something called the Great Barrington Declaration. Mm. And the three leaders are Dr. Martin um, Keldorf, who's from Harvard, um, Professor Sunetra Gupta, who's obviously Professor of Epidemiology at Oxford, and um, Professor Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford Medical School. And what they are um, advocating is something called focused guidance, which means basically that you allow um, most people to function normally, but you shield the vulnerable particularly the elderly and people with um, com compromised immune systems. And um, there's a very fundamental scientific difference of opinion uh, here, which is that the um, Professor Sunitra Gupta and others believe that you can achieve herd immunity with as little as between 10 and 20% of the population infected. Whereas the sage people, the Imperial College people believe that you need 60 to 70 percent of infections in order to achieve herd immunity. So um, while people say, you know, we must back the science, we must, we must be guided by the science, it's important to understand that scientists differ in their interpretation and in terms of their policy. Yeah. So I think the situation is, is simply that there's a plurality of views, but at the moment the lockdown camp is firmly in control, isn't it? And that's, I suppose, for our purposes uh, as investors, um, that's that's the situation what we're dealing with at the moment, isn't it? So I just it want to is. move on to um, the, the implications in terms of the what is the new normal? Out, you know, what does that look like, um, and what are the implications for for the markets? Well. Um, Pretty negative overall, but as we wrote in the special report that we published back in uh, April, 15th of April, that came out, and we're going to refer to our antivirus portfolio that we put together, there would be some sectors that gain from this, the on -time online re retailers, vaccinators, um, pharmaceutical companies, um, the supermarkets, certain tech stocks, um, anything involved in communications, so the Zoom share price has tripled uh, since April, uh, something that we, you know, we anticipated that it, it, would, it would prosper. Um, but there are whole sections of the economy which are really in agony. And, uh, you know, with the, effectively the prospect of a second lockdown and um, Keir Starmer and others are advocating this so-called circuit breaker, which as I understand it is a a, a short, maybe a two week, uh, severe and very restrictive lockdown. All that is going to be um, more pain for the hospitality industry, um, for travel and tourism, obviously, 
uh, for airlines, um, for um, entertainment, for the live entertainment, the theatre, which is is really crippled. Um, of course, there are corresponding um, people who, who 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 benefit from some of these um, displacements within the economy. So obviously, Netflix is doing very well. Yep. If we, can, if we can just bring up the next slide. Um, yep. So obviously the tech sector has been doing extraordinarily well. Um, and as you can see from the, the chart, um, the, the concentration in the top five uh, capitalized stocks in the S&P 500 is now at higher levels than it was back in the dot-com, uh, you know, the heady dot-com days. So that in itself, you know, that, that presents risks, doesn't it, over the long term for investors. Um, Obviously, you know, they're priced as they are at the moment because tech stocks seem to be the only game in town, don't they? But um, it does seem to me that we, we, we've reached a point now where the market is is fundamentally unbalanced. Would, would you agree with that, Victor? Well, most of the ap action has been in the US market. I mean, we could, we'll talk about the UK market in a, a, a moment, um, but it, it, it has not really um, prospered that, that well. And in fact, it's been pretty lack of the overall um, but the powering away of the U.S. markets, as you say, has been driven largely by um, the very large tech stocks, of which you know the, the, the fangs, the, 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 the top five, uh, now account for something like 20% of the market capitalization of the Nasdaq. So you've got a very high degree of, of concentration in that market, and obviously any stock movement within those uh, stocks pushes the market um, generally upwards, but um, all the action is is there. Um, I'll mention in a moment that there are some tech stocks which are fairly, if not conservatively, valued as well. Mm. Um, but I, I agree that the degree of concentration is is a cause for concern. But I don't see those large tech tech stocks going south. For the moment, um, mm. at, at, at least in the short to medium term, the reason being that they are all uh, natural monopolies who yep. are visibly um, prospering in this um, panda age of, uh, of pandemic. Yep. You know, all their fundamentals are uh, extremely robust, um, and you, you, you know, they're just powering away and, and still have massive growth prospects. Um, it's worth Noting, by the way, yesterday Apple announced a new iPhone. It's their first dedicatedly 5G uh, device. And interestingly, their share price actually stumbled. I don't know if you saw that. So I didn't actually, no. It was down 4% I, last night. So I did read that the, the Apple share price generally outperforms the S&P 500 by about 15% after a new iPhone is launched, though. That so, normally, yes. So yeah. it's quite interesting that yesterday with the range of new product launches of which this uh, 5G device, um, the market was not particularly impressed. So I haven't really got to, put the, to the bottom of that, but um, it's not all one way. But you, you have this extraordinary situation where, um, as of today, Apple is capitalized at $2.1 trillion. Yep. So that one firm... Uh, has a higher market cap than the entire FTSE 100. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Um, and what about the regulatory risk with these companies? Because we've got, a, you know, significant um, likelihood of uh, Joe Biden becoming the next president of the USA. So yes, what, what's the outlook in, from that perspective? Well, we'll we'll talk about Trump Biden in a moment in more detail, but. Um, the, 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 if Mr. Biden becomes president, he might take on board um, some of the proposals which have been advanced by the, uh, the, the, the House um, Antitrust Committee. And, and, and what's on the table is something along the, other, the following lines. First of all, they would, seek, they would set out to block further M&A within the tech sector. Um, now, in hindsight, it probably would have been appropriate to have blocked Facebook's takeover of WhatsApp um, five years ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, because that's given them huge leverage and, and effectively they've integrated 
uh, WhatsApp into the, 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 the Facebook data machine. Yep. That's why um, when you phone someone now on their mobile phone, um, you'll often get their profile coming up on your, on your Facebook wall. <laughs> you know, because <clears throat> excuse me, that they're integrated. So I think that could well happen anyway. I think probably in the natural course of events, there will be more restrictions on MA within um, the tech titans, certainly, and within yeah. the tech uh, sector generally. The, the second thing that the Antitrust Commission is, is looking at is to force the tech companies, which are all fundamentally data companies of one kind or another, to share their data with third parties. Now, that's an interesting idea, and it sounds like you know, it's, it's, it's benign, but actually the practicalities of that are quite um, convoluted. I mean, data of it in and of itself isn't valuable. It's what you do with the data. It's how you manipulate it. It's how you mine it. And, and that's why there's a you know, huge upsurge in interest in this data mining and, 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 and data analysis uh, tools. So you had uh, Palantir, came to market, I think, the week before last. Um, uh, you've got uh, Snowflake, which um, has had rocketed since, since launch on the 16th of September. And that's, that's a really sexy domain because they can take data from the large tech companies and they can crunch it in ways that the tech companies can't do themselves. So let's say you force Facebook to share its data with other tech firms. Well, it doesn't follow that that will actually um, reduce Facebook's um, preponderant position within social media. Okay, so I think, I think that's, that one is going to be on the agenda, but I think it's, it's actually um, quite difficult to crack. Um, and I, I somehow doubt that anything really tangible will come of it. So um, um, if we, I think we're agreed that the the large tech firms, you know, they, we don't we don't see much you know, huge downside in the near term, but you know, they they are the sort of um, the big lumbering elephants in the the sector, aren't they? What about some of the the other um, companies that you, you were looking at, the uh, the yes. IBMs of this world and the Oracles? Well, I, I think they're lumbering elephants, but they're, they're also, you know, um, extremely nimble in the, the, the way that they respond. <laughs> elephants do I mean, gallop. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, can I just say, James, the third thing that the Antitrust Commission was looking at was the possibility of a kind of tech Glass-Steagall Act. You remember Glass-Steagall was in yep. the 1930s during the Great Depression. Yep. When Separating the, investment it, banks and retail banks. Yeah? Exactly so. And the, the, the proposal is that you split software from hardware. Well, actually, that sounds neat. So Apple becomes a maker of, of, of phones, but it's, it, it's deprived of its app store. Um, that all sounds fine, but actually, you can't run hardware without having pre-installed software. Mm. So separating the two is not as easy as it sounds. Um, yeah, the, in, in the next, I think it's the next slide, is it? James, we yep. looked, Can we get the I, next looked slide at, um, I, I, I was looking at some research which was being uh, done by, um, by Seeking Alpha. And um, what one of their analysts has done is to compare and contrast share, the share price performance with all the underlying fundamentals. And what he is saying is that um, there is a, a part of the tech universe um, which is actually very realistically uh, priced and which has a, a, a very good um, outlook going forward. <laughs> so we shouldn't regard tech as being one monolithic thing. You've got the tech titans out there. Mm. You've got a number of, uh, of major established players and you've also got these new startups coming on stream and, 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 and the, the, the unicorns which are yet to prove themselves. And just for your... Um, it may be a bit of interest. The six stocks, this, this one is Oracle, obviously. The six stocks which he thinks are quite fairly priced and maybe may have more uh, potential on the upside are IBM, Cisco, Oracle, which is featured here, uh, Qualcomm, 
Broadcom and ADP, that's uh, Automatic Data Processing, which is a, a chip manufacturer. So I think it, I would be wary of saying tech is overpriced as a broad brush comment. I think there is an issue about the, you know, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft valuations, um, but I don't see them coming down in the immediate future. Okay, and we touched on, you know, the, the, the potential for uh, Biden becoming next president. Um, yes. You've been doing some some research, haven't you, on um, on this? Can we see the next slide, please? Yes, please. Yeah. So looking at the um, opinion polls, Biden's going to win. No shadow of a doubt about it. But hang on. There are reasons to suppose that some of these uh, polls may be overstating Biden's advantage. And by the way, if you look at the the bottom chart, you'll see that the Biden's lead over Trump is actually uh, widening. So he's currently thought to be something between nine and 11 points ahead in terms of the popular vote, in terms of um, polling vote, voter intentions. Now, um, there's an outfit called Trafalgar Group. And what's interesting about this group, it's a, it's a data company, it's a pollster, and they do consulting, and they're based in Georgia. And the interesting thing is that they were the only outfit to call the 2016 presidential election correctly. And they were predicting a Trump victory based on a you know, very similar number of votes, but the way those votes would be spread across the 50 states would be such that Trump would have the advantage in the Electoral College, which is exactly what happened. In fact, Hillary Clinton actually pulled more votes than Mr. Trump. Um, but he won because he, he captured the Electoral College quite substantially. So they are saying that, in fact, um, the difference between Biden and Trump is much narrower than has been portrayed by the opinion polls. And there are basically, I guess, four or five reasons for this. The first one is that there are a lot of shy Trump supporters. So there's a lot of people who might have worn their MAGA baseball caps back in 2016 <laughs> who are keeping them at home and they, they're not putting their posters in their windows for fear that you, you know they'll have, to have their house burnt down yep. in the current climate um, and it turns out a lot of people don't even tell their family members that they vote for Mr. Trump so you know <laughs> we could discuss that um, but that is that seems to be a sort of a, a cephalogical fact um, Secondly, you've got, um, and I don't want to be pejorative, but you've got um, a certain population of, of, of what I call lazy de Democrats. Those are people who um, instinctively sympathize with Biden and the Democratic cause, but they will either fail to register or they will actually not turn up to vote come polling day. Um, and it is true that there has been a huge campaign to get people who might be of Democratic inclination to register and we all know certain celebrities have been involved in that uh, cause um, and it looks like registrations are up which is probably good news uh, for Biden but there is still a very substantial minority of people who will not vote remember that the turnout in the last US presidential election was something like 53 percent so that's 47 percent of the population of the, of, of, of the of the, of the adult population who didn't bother to vote for one reason or another. In, 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 in the UK, the last election, as I recall, it was something like 68%. So, and that's considered low by European standards. So um, that is a, 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 an important factor. Um, the third reason is that despite the poll on voting intentions, um, all the polls which ask about economic confidence favor Trump. And it's about 60-40 uh, in Trump's favor against Biden. So they see Trump as good for the economy. And a number of people uh, will forgive the handling of the coronavirus pandemic on the basis that in normal conditions, uh, Trump will preside over a, a buoyant and dynamic economy and that he, he's got his tax policies are, are what is needed. So that's economic competence. Um, it's interesting, when we look at the demographic 
profile, um, there's a tendency to think that all demographic um, subdivisions, Hispanics, um, African Americans, and so forth, all vote in the same intent it, it direction. But that's not true. There are no even the Jewish um, American Israeli Americans don't vote all in one direction. Um, but it is true that there's a huge preponderance of um, African-American voters who favor uh, Biden. But in contrast, it does seem that uh, Trump's share of the Hispanic population has increased. And during the um, Trump-Biden um, debate uh, way back at the beginning of this month, um, the, the Telemundo, which is a Spanish-speaking US channel, carried out a poll. And they reckoned that two thirds of Hispanics uh, thought that Trump had won. So um, the final reason for, is that um, the Electoral College is what determines who becomes president. And the Democra Democratic vote is concentrated in certain large states, uh, of which obviously California, which has 53 electoral votes. And they will most certainly win California, no question. California is very liberal, uh, very blue. Um, but Trump is actually edging ahead in a number of, 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 uh, of key states, um, of which Arizona, okay, that's only 11 uh, electoral votes. He probably, well, it's, it, it's pretty close, but he will probably take Florida, which was what he needed last time. And he certainly does need Florida with 25 electoral votes. And he, he may well manage to maintain Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, and Pennsylvania. And if, if, on that basis, you know, he could end up with the largest number of uh, electoral college votes. And um, Trafalgar Group has actually made a, a calculation that he will narrowly win in the electoral college with about 275 votes. He needs to get 269 or more to cross the line. So, so assuming, assuming Trump wins, um, what does this mean for, um, for US-China relations then? Because this is a biggie, isn't it, in terms of you know, the outlook for the global economy? Um, and if we can just move to the, the next slide. Yes. Um, China is actually bouncing back quite well, isn't it, so far from the, um, the COVID crisis? Well, first it's, in, it's... first out, as we as we've got yeah. on the top there. <laughs> it's quite remarkable, but um, the Chinese economy has rebounded. And as you can see, the, uh, China has grown very dramatically in every single quarter over the last 25 years until Q1 2020, when they were down uh, nearly 6%. Um, and that was obviously the, 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 the impact of the virus and of, of the lockdown in Wuhan. But remember, there was never a a nationwide lockdown in China. It was always confined to um, Hubei province and to you know, neighboring areas. Um, and look at uh, Q2, when we were down by nearly 20, 20 odd percent in the UK, China was up 5.2%. And I also saw some figures yesterday there, year on year exports uh, in September grew by over 9%. So the Chinese economy is humming but having said that, the overall secular trend in Chinese growth is downwards. And you know, China, which had sustained eight to 10% growth for so many years, as you can see from this chart, um, may only be growing at uh, you know, 4% come uh, 2025. Um, of course, we'd love to have a 4% you know, growth metric, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the overall trend is, is downwards. And correspondingly, India's growth is likely to be trending upwards, albeit that they've had a very hard knock uh, due to the pandemic. So in terms of US-China relations, um, it, it's been under Trump that China has really emerged as an adversary of the United States in the geopolitical sphere. And Trump has made this almost official. And therefore, you cannot disentangle trade relations and the uh, you know, prospective trade treaty with the overall rivalry between these two superpowers. Is it your view, Victor, that are we, are we moving towards a kind of uh, 
a situation like we had before the, the Second World War, where the world kind of split it into separate autarchies, as they called them. Um, it, it, do you think that's a, a, a likely um, outcome? Well, um, in a sense, that's already happening in the tech sector. When you look at um, what's been, I was writing last week about microprocessors, computer chips, and basically it seems that the American strategic objective is to deprive China of new advances in chip technology. And therefore, America is quite naturally, in, in a sense, pressurizing its allies to collaborate with American uh, tech firms and not with Chinese ones. And th th this is why the, the Huawei uh, argument was a really a watershed because um, you know, Mr. Johnson, in his wisdom, decided to go with Huawei, and there was a huge um, reaction to that, as people say these days, pushback. I, I prefer the word reaction. <laughs> um, um, and effectively, he had to make a U-turn. Um, I mean, Huawei is a very strange and actually rather sinister uh, outfit, and I think there are all kinds of reasons to suppose that it's very highly um, embedded with the uh, Chinese Communist Party. So uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot separate um, technology from security issues these days. What about the Chinese stock market? Because that's been pretty buoyant, hasn't it, since, um, you know, since this, yes. this, um, this crisis kicked off? So, I mean, would you, would you go out there and buy Chinese stocks, Victor? <laughs> well, me, me personally, I just don't like the degree of corporate governance in the Chinese market. I don't think that you can have a, you know, normal set of, uh, set of investor relations with companies that are um, manipulated by their own government. Um, I mean, you might say that that's now becoming the case in the US because, uh, you know, the, 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 the administration is interfering in, in corporate issues, corporate governance issues. Um, and I've always felt that, you know, um, you, you don't really get any real voting rights um, as a, an investor in uh, Chinese equities. I mean, you know, I think you, you, you have to look at, I, I personally follow markets that I can understand. And I, I'm not a China expert. Um, so long as there is growth in China, the, uh, you know, the, the upside potential is still there. And in fact, the largest IPO this year uh, is likely to be um, the spin-off from uh, WeChat, um, or from, from Alibaba, rather, um, of, of which you know, Jack Ma is the, 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 the major um, uh, shareholder. Mm. Um, and that's going to dwarf all other um, IPOs this year. So the, the scale of the market is quite extraordinary. The, the other thing one has to be careful about uh, in China is that the Hong Kong market, which has been where most of China's um, internationally traded stocks have been listed, is going to be increasingly integrated with Shanghai as part of this ongoing process of absorbing Hong Kong back into the, the motherland. And there may be, uh, again, there may be regulatory issues associated with that. So, yeah. Sorry, Victor. Go, on. Go ahead. Um, and just bringing us back um, back to the UK, um, UK government uh, government finances. If we can just move on to the next slide, by the way. Yes. Um, sorry, can we move to the next one and then move back to that one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so UK um, public debt. Um, it's not looking good, is it, Victor? <laughs> it's looking terrible. It's it, it's awful. I mean. Uh, all you need to know about this slide is that um, the amount of government debt, that's how much our government owes to uh, holders of its papers, has gone up from 1.8 uh, trillion pounds in March to over 2.2 trillion pounds at the end of August. So that's an increase of 400 billion pounds, which is you know, not too much if you say it quickly. But it's, that's, it, that's taken us above 100% of GDP, hasn't it, for the first time since what was it? Since after the war? Since since after the war. Yeah. Um, 
so we've gone from something like 82 percent of um uh, our debt to gdp ratio has gone from 82 percent to over 100 something like 102 um so in the budget if you remember mr sunak's first and last budget was on the 11th of march he was looking at a you know the, the, the debt to gdp ratio gradually and smoothly um going downwards over the next five years to something that you know most of us have been used to in our lifetime um remember un under gordon brown um for most of the time the debt to gdp ratio was was around 30 to 35 percent mm. which you know this seems unbelievable now um but this kind of increase is obviously long term or medium term unsustainable and the problem now is that we we thought the furlough scheme was going to be uh, dismantled and that you know they're, they're, we would resume normal activity and now instead we've had to mr sunak has had to put in place another scheme whereby people are you know the state effectively pays people's wages not quite so generous as the job retention scheme but still pretty pretty generous by international standards so that number is going to continue to head up and the inevitable consequence of that is that sooner rather than later we brits people living here in the uk we're going to have to pay higher taxes and that's going to be a long-term drag on economic growth which hasn't been performing particularly well in the last um 10 years certainly since the financial crisis but the, so, these obligations can't be met by tax rises alone can they i mean no, they can't. We, we've got to also be looking at sort of spending cuts and higher inflation haven't we because i suppose we've got to remember that you know the uk is one of the only countries in europe that's still got control of its own monetary policy so um presumably you know we can we can kind of inflate our way out of this as well can't we well it is true that um, you mentioned you know the post-war situation where the debt was actually up to 200 percent of, of, of gdp in, in 1945 46 um the, the UK government managed to get that down basically through economic growth, which was you know, reasonably um, vibrant in, the, in, in some parts of the 50s and 60s. Um, and of course, inflation. So they inflated away their debt. Now, the problem with inflation, if you unleash inflation, interest rates will have to go up unless you go through some sort of extraordinary monetary contortion and allow um, real interest rates to become negative. Um, so if interest rates go up, then the cost of the debt will go up. And already, you know, the cost of, of, of servicing our national debt, even last year, was something equivalent to what we spend on defence. If, you know, interest rates were to go up to, you know, even quite mundane levels, like one to two percent, we might see that uh, level of debt service uh, gaining equivalence with what we spend on the National Health Service, and then you really are in a pickle because your 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 spending um, options are narrowed very considerably. And you mentioned spending cuts. I just think the problem is, it, politically speaking, unpalatable, uh, <laughs> incredibly difficult and unpalatable, uh, particularly for a government which you know might have you know to some degree lost some authority after this uh, pandemic so i i uh, i you know i i would hesitate to criticize um mr johnson and his colleagues but i wouldn't want their job because um i don't think there's any way that you know um there is a there is an easy solution for this what about the uk stock market then because you know people have been saying that the FTSE is trading like a, an emerging market these days. Like, what is there any value in UK UK stocks? Do you think? Yeah, that was your previous slide, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, if you can just move back. Yeah, yeah. here we go. I mean, um, I, 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 let's not go into the technical analysis of what's going on here, but I think people can share the slides later anyway. Um, basically, this is a slide which is suggesting that relative to other markets, the UK is undervalued. Um, and I, th I think there are basically um, two or three main reasons for that. The first is that the UK market is still predominantly, um, a, a, and particularly in terms of the FTSE 100, a market of 
very stable, mature uh, companies um, with pretty low earnings volatility, um, financed by debt, very good dividend payout. And so a lot of people have been buying the UK market for its dividend yield, which was, I think, around 4% last year. Yeah, um, they've, they've got burned, haven't they? <laughs> now, um, e even BP cancelled its dividend. I mean, that's, that's absolutely you know, unconscionable. Um, because BB, BP is the, you know, the staple. I, I think Royal Dutch, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell hadn't cut its dividend since 1945, uh, since during the war. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so this is this is extraordinary that um, companies which were at least boring, stable companies, large companies, without much growth uh, prospects, at least could be relied upon to pay a decent dividend. And now that's that's not going to happen anymore. Um, and I mean the problem with the UK market is that there aren't enough really um, hot, um, high growth tech stocks. And I mean, you, 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 you have some smaller um, firms in the pharmaceutical sector and in IT, um, but there are simply not enough of them and they're not big enough. And that's, you know, M Mr. Cummings uh, has a dream of, um, you know, uh, growing a stable of, of, of trillion dollar unicorns in the UK market. Well, good luck with that, but I, I, it's not gonna happen yet. Um, isn't the problem that they always get sold off to the Americans before they can get anywhere near that level? <laughs> this is a very big issue, I tell you. And I, I wrote about this in terms of ARM and NVIDIA last, last week. And I have, have a, a, a few things to say about that. But a, a, another reason why the UK market is lagging is that... Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that um, sterling is perceived as a weak currency, which is being squeezed between the dollar and the euro and um, overseas investors um, know that there, there is currency risk associated with investing in, into the UK market. So putting all these things together, um, UK hasn't done very well, um, certainly against a backdrop of political risk. We'll talk about Brexit mm. in a moment. Um, we thought that um, there was it, it, the Brexit issue had been resolved, but but no, it's, it, it's possibly going to get even worse. Um, so all told, I mean, the UK market is, 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 is pretty flat and I, I don't see the prospects changing in the immediate future. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we had a couple of, well, we had six sterling denominated stocks in our antivirus portfolio and we'll come look at how they did um, in the final slide, I think. Yeah. And so what is the Brexit endgame then? Because obviously this is the backdrop to the to the UK's um, economic future, isn't it, at the moment? What what are the prospects yeah. for a trade deal? What what does global Britain look like, do you think? Yeah. Well, there's a nice little slide with a picture of our, our prime minister coming up, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, we're really on a like the bulldog in the, the, the other picture. <laughs> 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 Bring the dog out, yeah. Um, it's a knife edge, and the news flow is really changing day by day right now. Last weekend, it looked as if there might be room for a compromise, where be there, there, there could be a free trade agreement with some concessions on fishing rights uh, to be f with, with, with the UK reclaiming its territorial waters and fish. Um, in, in phased stages. Um, and there was, there was some rumors put out to the effect that um, a deal was actually doable. In the last two days, it's gone in the other direction. The French fishing minister uh, yesterday announced that you know, France would veto any uh, free trade deal with the UK. And last night, Frau Merkel um, instructed German manufacturers to prepare for a, um, a no deal Brexit which means that you know, um, the likes of um, BMW and Mercedes um, will have to think about you know, having tariffs imposed on their, on their products when they enter the UK. Should we take so, all this seriously though? Is, is this not you know, sort of um, 11th hour kind of um, you know, political theatre to try and 
whip the UK into line, maybe? <laughs> well, it's it's more than 11th hour. It's one minute to midnight, really. <laughs> the, the deal was supposed to be finalised by 15th of October, which, which is tomorrow. That, that's not going to happen. Failing that, um, it doesn't get ratified by the European Parliament before 1st of January. So I think the, the EU side did say that they were willing to negotiate into the middle of November, though, didn't they, I think? Well, they've, they've been pushing back the timetable, so that, I don't know, the Parliament, uh, the European Parliament isn't going to have any Christmas holiday at this rate. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at it in the political framework, and I'll come to the economic outcome afterwards. Um, whatever happens now, I'm afraid the political risks for the UK Tory government are, are extreme, because if they concede on uh, fishing rights and on uh, state protection, that's uh, subsidies, and they get a, a, a deal which is uh, perceptibly inferior to the Canada EU deal, um, there will be a large section of the Tory party itself and those who've come into the Tory party from outside, of which the, the red wall voters up in your part of the world, mm. um, who will say that it's a, it's a sellout and that effectively it's um, Brexit in name only, and that um, you know, um, their dreams of a, uh, an independent Britain have been undermined. Um, but to the extent that e even if there is uh, some kind of deal which has a, um, a zero tariff regime, there are likely to be certain frictions, which means a a extra costs in terms of cross-border trade, and there will be a large and possibly growing faction of opinion which says, well, actually, we'd be better off as a member of the EU rather than this sort of rather peculiar status outside with an inferior um, trade agreement. So that will probably um, coalesce uh, around the, the Labour Party and the, the, the Liberal Party, such as they are, they're, they're very low in the polls. Um, are already committed to uh, rejoining the EU at the first opportunity. But I, I, I don't think that rejoiner element is ever going to go away. And the, the problem is that um, the UK on its own outside the EU, and I was writing about this a few weeks ago, um, really looks to be very lonely. And the, for people like myself and others who... Um, really determined that, you know, that given the choice, we would vote to leave, is that we foresaw that there would be some kind of future arrangement with uh, particularly our, the, the other great English speaking democracies. And this generally goes by the name of CANSA, that's Canada, Australia, New Zealand, teaming up with the UK with um, a, a very high degree of economic um, cooperation possibly integration of military assets. So we, we have a um, you know, very strong level of, of, of alliance at the military and strategic level, and probably a high degree of freedom of movement, um, meaning that we can go and work in Australia, possibly, and they can come and work uh, in the UK. But albeit there will always be some restrictions on that because the, the New Zealanders who are you know, a, a country of 5.3 million people don't want to be uh, swamped by UK pensioners coming and, and you know, um, using their excellent healthcare system. So it, 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 it will never be, you know, um, total and, and full freedom of movement. There will always be limits to it. But um, basically, with the cor coronavirus pandemic, all of this strategic uh, thinking about where Britain goes post-Brexit has been put on hold. And despite the fact that the former uh, Australian High Commissioner to the UK, Alexander Downer, who is actually a former um, Australian Foreign Minister, being very um, upbeat and, uh, and much in favour of, 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 of Kanzuk, at the political level, very little has happened. So um, some of us are beginning to worry about whether this government really has a strategic outlook going forward and um, there will be a lot of political flack almost whatever the outcome of the uh, negotiations and I, 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 I'm just concerned that um, 
this government is going to lose the political capital to set a new course for our international relations. So I would say I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. And what about the global outlook? Because that V-shaped recovery is looking less and less likely, isn't it? Can we see the, uh, the next slide? Yeah. Um, James, just to be aware, this is based on um, an OECD forecast, which came out at the end of June. So it's not really cut, it's a little bit out of date. But the overall shape of the forecast, I think, is probably correct, based, based on their assumption that um, there would be no second wave. Um, we would still not recover in 2021. Um, it would take at least two years to recover back to Q4 um, 2019 levels of output. This is, this is globally. Um, but I mean, depending on your, your use of terminology, we're now in a second wave, mm. which is going to further restrict um, economic growth. It's pro it probably means the economy is going to grow, um, it's, it's going to decline again in 2021. If you look at the next slide, James, um, this one is um, hot off the press. I got this from The Economist uh, last night. And in fact, um, this is based on, um, IMF data, which was published very recently. And as you can see, the um, forecast for economic, um, negative economic growth in April has revi been revised downwards as of this month um, for next year for almost every country. And there are some extreme cases of which, you know, Lebanon, where political factors obviously um, are in play. Um, but in, in, in terms of Britain, um, we're looking at, you know, um, it, 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 an, out, an out turn of around minus 10% um, for 2020 on the previous year. And the likelihood would be that we're going to have further negative growth in 2021. So, it, it, it comes back to this question of how long do you think the, the, the pandemic is going to last? Do, do you want to talk about that? Um, we can do briefly, Victor, but then I think we, we need, just need to move on to the, um, yep. the portfolio. Yep. Uh, I think a lot of politicians, both in this country and elsewhere, are waiting for the cavalry to arrive, namely in the form of a <laughs> vaccine. And they imagine that uh, a new vaccine will solve the problem within months. Well, I think that is a chimera, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, first of all, the, the, the quicker a vaccine is produced, the more likely it will be that it has um, adverse um, outcomes for some uh, patients, some people who receive it. And to the extent that there is publicity about adverse outcomes about people getting sick, um, there will be take up for the new vaccine will be disinhibited. And by the way, there won't be one vaccine, there are going to be about 12. And different vaccines will have different efficacy and different, different side effects. So um, that, that, that complicates the picture. But um, you know, according to some uh, studies, you, you need about a 70% take up over a reasonable, reasonably short time period for a vaccine to generate herd immunity. So the rise of the anti-vaxxers, and that's being intensified by rather these rather sinister groups like QAnon, um, that, 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 that is concerning because it, it, it could mean that a vaccine in fact becomes ineffective. And even if it, it is effective, um, we should be very concerned about possible um, side effects. Moreover, we don't know yet how long a vaccine will confer immunity. And it might be that, in fact, uh, it's only a few months, so you need boosters and you have to go back, just as at the moment you need a, a flu vaccine every year. Um, and there might indeed, as the Prime Minister for the first time admitted yesterday, there might not be a vaccine at all, or at least not one that can be licensed you know, for, for general circulation. So, so given, given this uh, backdrop then, Victor, um, if we can just move on to the, the next slide, the final slide. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
we put together a portfolio, didn't we, back in April um, to sort of, you know, withstand or at least be resilient in the face of all this uncertainty that was brought about by coronavirus. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm glad to say it's, um, it's performed quite well, hasn't it? It has. I think we did a good job, um, if, we, if I may say so. Um, so we, we signed off on that report on the 13th of April and the prices displayed there of those stocks are as of the 12th of October. So that's an, exactly six months. And over that uh, six months, if you just take the dollar positions, um, the overall gain for any notional um, portfolio, assuming that you allocated equally across all holdings, um, comes out at around 42%. Um, if, you, if you mix in the six um, uh, sterling denominated holdings and the one euro denominated uh, stock, which is Sanofi, um, you, you get a return of 33, is it 0.21% over six months, which is pretty good uh, when you consider the FTSE uh, 100 has, has moved up by 3.73% over the same period. So what we did, as you know, and we worked together on this, we just looked at those areas, those sectors, which were likely to profit, and we chose uh, star stocks within each uh, sector. And um, some did better than others. You've got Zoom here, which we predicted would, 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 would prosper, and it's up by 270% over six months. Um, some have not done as well as we might have supposed. So uh, Gilead Sciences, which manuf manufactures Remdesivir, which is what President Trump uh, was taking uh, the other week in the in, in, uh, military hospital. Um, not, not Dettol, then. <laughs> not Dettol. <laughs> That's actually down. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is that the jury is still out on Remdesivir. And uh, as you know, Remdesivir was um, developed as an antiviral treatment for the Ebola virus. Um, but it, it has not be prove, been proven to be efficacious in the treatment of um, coronavirus, of, of, of CV-19. So um, if anybody listening to this actually followed our recommendations and invested accordingly, well, uh, well done, because hopefully you're in the money, um, despite all the terrible gloom and doom. Um, and I think one of the main takeaways for me, Victor, is that more than ever now, I mean, people always say this, but diversification is, is the one, it's the one free lunch for investors, isn't it, at the moment? Um, and it's, it's really come into its own at the moment, I think, given the, the huge level of uncertainty. Yes. Um, that said, I mean, diversification is, is great. You have to have biases within your diversification strategy. And my, my bias, as you know, would be towards tech and to some degree towards um, uh, a farmer. I like, um, um, well, uh, one or two opportunities in, 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 in retail, in even bricks and mortar, the, the supermarkets, but interestingly, Tesco there, which um, announced excellent results a couple of days ago, is actually down on the six months. So um, obviously, what, uh, Ocado, which has a stronger online presence, is up sixty-two uh, percent. So I think whatever we do, um, we're going to be quite highly allocated to tech. Okay, and on that note, um, I'm going to end it there because we've we've already run over time. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and of course to uh, to Victor for taking part. Thank you. Um, just a final reminder that we'd really appreciate your feedback, so please do fill in the survey. Um, don't forget to save the date for our next webinar, which is on the 28th of October at 1pm, where I'll be navigating the risky but exciting world of small cap miners with John Cornford. Um, finally, if you've not done so already, don't forget to secure your ticket for Master Investor, which um, the show which takes place on the 4th and 5th of December. You'll find a link um, to the tickets in the chat box. And that's it from us. Thanks, everyone. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.